uh, academy assisted psychotherapy, and then maybe we'll talk about you know, uh, other emerging trends in psychedelic medicine, and then we'll follow that with you guys and talk about your uh, integration therapy work. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here uh, and involved in this movement. So uh, I started in medicine and psychiatry, I did a fellowship in child psychiatry. So I, you know, was intimately involved. I know you don't like the pharmaceutical, but I was intimately involved with the conventional psychiatrist, uh, psychiatry role. And what I noticed after 5, 10, 15 years is that nothing is working. Nothing's getting better. These people are not, these pills are not helping them. And really, what you put into it, you know, encouraging them to get better sleep, get better diet, get better nutrition, um, eliminate you know, stressors, then that starts to change a little bit. And then, then maybe medicine can, you know, take the edge off, but it's not going to really be in the uh, end all. And so, when I was then, I kind of got involved with this genetic test that a lot of people who were saying, what medicine can I, would work better for me, they were becoming positive for something called MTHFR. And really it's a nutritional issue that when you give methylated weight, maybe their brain starts working again. And so I've noticed with nutrition or dietary changes or supplements, you can really help uh, mental health. And so I started a natural wellness, uh, called brain and split wellness, where you do IV, vitamin C, IV uh, nutrients, and we're getting amazing results for the health, you know, those who really treatment resistant depression, that would be not enough for them. And so we're kind of like, what can I do uh, for the people I was trained in, yet uh, need to treat? Uh, and so that's where Kennedy, you know, started to become, uh, you know, more appealing. I read about it in all these journals. It was used forever since the 50s uh, as an anesthetic agent. And, and even in veterinary medicine, so uh, not that it was, it's a horse tranquilizer, but because it's safe and natural for uh, you know, populations that can't communicate well, animals that really can't articulate their issues, you can give them something safe, do your treatment, and, and they work you know, without, uh, without uh, harm. And what they noticed with ketamine uh, in the medical field especially in Vietnam, they would give it to wounded soldiers, and those wounded soldiers, uh, and it was nice because it's safe, you don't need a respirator, you don't need much monitoring, so you could give it in the battlefield, and they uh, sew them up and then get them back to battle, and what they noticed is those wounded soldiers that received ketamine did not develop PTSD, yet maybe an onlooker that would have so much, uh, you know, witness trauma, did get very uh, symptomatic. And so they're kind of seeing what is it that gives that protective measure. And that's where they're kind of figuring out there's something called neuroplasticity and that we can change our brain. We're always told that we can't change our brain. Our brain's always going to have to on. And uh, we can change our brain. There are Kennedy in one way and then the other psychedelics in the future can also kind of really help that. Neuroplasticity in the brain. So that, is, that was the answer. And I was set up for an IV uh, already giving IV nutrients, whereas conventional psychiatrists maybe never would touch their patients. And so to give an IV to somebody is uh, a procedure that we would not never do past residency. So uh, it was, I had to do it. Uh, and so what we, we started in 18 with uh, treatment resistant depression. That's sort of the, what it was started for. Um, the NIMH did a study and did find about uh, that did find six infusions within about two to three weeks. We have about 80, 70 to 80 percent remission rates for depression. And when they take remission, they're talking about scores on the rating scale that went from 30. Can you speak up, please? Sure. Sorry. Can I use the microphone? Okay, sure. Please. No, Thank no. you. This bed has a hard time hearing. No problem. <laughs> So, I'm not really sure where uh, I left off, but uh, we started using ketamine uh, IV in 18 at my practice. For, I mean, we started with treatment-resistant depression, because that was what it was really only used for. 
um, and then uh, saw really great results. People, you know, suicidal thinking uh, would come in, and even after one infusion, would say, you know, those thoughts just vanished, and I don't find them anymore. And when you hear that once, it's amazing. You hear it twice, and consistently, it's you know really something to talk about. Uh, then the pandemic happened, and then there's a whole bunch of legalization for cannabis that I was involved in, and saw amazing results with that plant as well. Uh, and then, but now it was treatment-resistant depression. You know, fast forward uh, post COVID, it's everybody. You know, everybody has been affected by some loss. If it's loss of business, loss of life, loss of socialization, and so now not only should it be there for resistant depression, it really be, should be there for anybody who needs it, and that really kind of segues into that right to cry. You know, all mental health is potentially debilitating uh, illness, and we need to have better tools because we have no good tools. Uh, and there's not lots of research going on uh, also uh, at fine institutions at Hopkins and, multi and globally about uh, psilocybin and uh, other psychedelics in the future. So this is going to be something Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, let, let's let's take a quick pause and see if anyone has any questions about. Uh... Yes, I can. Uh, you said about I think you said eight percent eight percent success rate of resistant mm -hmm. resistant and it goes into remission. And so, are the the long term studies of how soon it might come back, or does it just take a stressor to trigger it again? Is it like that? Or does it put it in remission for quite some time? Yeah, great question. So this was the NIMH study in 2006, and they saw that two or you know uh, six infusions within two to three weeks yielded a 70, 70, 75 percent remission rate on scores of like the uh, depression rating scales. And so when and, and it's variable. Some people noticed it for six months to a year. Um, others were like quarterly, and I think it depended on how much, how like your baseline status or how much medication you were on prior. We, what we do at Radiance is, uh, you know, get you to that state where you're in remission, and then try to maintain that remission by natural means, cannabis, uh, vitamins, supplements, uh, and if you do need, if there are people that need ketamine maintenance, and uh, those are usually people who have been on medications for. And, uh, and really, it's either monthly IV infusions, which is better than a daily pill, or even now, um, we are working with compounding pharmacies that will compound a nasal or even oral ketamine protein. Uh, there's no patches because uh, they're not really finding this top. Well, actually, you know what? There are topicals for pain, um, but you know, really, there's, that's really going to work with the nerve more than the but either way, the oral and the nasal makes it accessible to, for everybody to use it in the home. So that really changes uh, the game because otherwise when you're using to around an infusion center, you know, given by a physician, now you can use it in lieu of uh, antidepressant. And really what, what you're following is uh, the psilocybin protocol, the microdosing. And the, you know, neuroplasticity is almost, you think of it as fertilizer for the brain. You don't need it every day, but uh, you know, once you, and even when you fertilize your plants, it's not gonna bloom overnight, but taking it every three days will grow those brain cells that in the event that you have a stressor or a trauma, you're gonna be more resilient and able to handle that stress. And it, uh, I do this with a vitamin B12. I, I do an injection, um, that oral, forget about that one. So I, I noticed that, that if I get down low for the vitamin D once I've taken uh, any antibiotic, then I'll run to the sun. I'm gonna go and get a lot of good food out of the that's the biggest worry. But I, I find that interesting that you're doing micro dosing with that and that that's available when you say through, so I can refer my daughter somehow to your site online. Yes, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. uh, questions? Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Um, for those who have a 
tried that, it's a complete, you know, letting go and, and allowing it to take effect. It was overwhelming and I couldn't let it go any further. You know, and that's also a concern that I haven't tried it my microdose, you know, any other kind of little psychedelic. Other than that, I'm hoping to, because I have a, a lot of trauma that I can't really recover from. And I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions for people with that kind of issue, the control and the block. Yeah, great question. Um, and maybe Michael has some more insight too, but what I I think that is sometimes very hard, you know, especially with trauma, um, to let go, and that is sort of the mantra when you are getting infusion, you know, trust, let go, and explore. And, and so if you can't, you know, let go, it can be hard to explore. Sometimes we, uh, you know, would address that by dosing, and then in, in an IM, muscular shot where you're getting sort of all the full dose at once and then it's sort of you know working that makes it a little bit easier it's kind of being pushed uh and then you know then you're gonna kind of experience that um the other thing is integrate you know just like most things you know even if you have a surgery um how are you gonna get your functioning back and we go to kind of like physical therapy same with uh these psychedelics, you know, there, there can be crazy stuff that come up. And how can you unpack that and adding in a therapist, you know, cap therapy, you know, well, even in psych conventional psychiatry, there was a pivotal study where adding CBD, CBT to SSRIs improves outcome. Now, now we're adding therapy to these medicines that change our trust and the relationship is so profoundly important for, mm -hmm. for trauma Yes, and then and then whereas ketamine may be kind of non-specific, you know, whereas it may help with depression and not so much anxiety, uh, there may be in the future more specific treatments for PTSD, and you alluded to that the MDMA coming up, and and so whereas when we have a whole bunch of ways to try, kind of things to try, just like our SSRI or other medications, now we can really pinpoint okay. If PTSD, this may work better for that, and psilocybin may work better for this, and addiction needs LSD, those kind of things. So hopefully there'll be lots of in the future. Let's, let's talk about the emerging research on like tobacco addiction or alcohol use disorder and uh, some of the uh, potential the clinical results in terms of like MDA psilocybin. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, they are, uh, right, and so if you are doing other things like addiction, they are using um, psilocybin, even at Hopkins, they're uh, doing a study on smoking cessation, and uh, even, you know, one treatment will give, will, you know, just dissolve cravings. So this is really exciting um, information. Uh, the LSD, they're also saying with addiction, and parts of the ayahuasca like DMT, other ayahuasca molecules, uh, when they were using it kind of sort of in these spiritual um, retreats, they found that the cravings for alcohol and other substances were much less. So there are lots of uh, anecdotal evidence in the in globally, but also research undergoing right now at Hopkins and other uh, locations. And there's good results for opiates too. Opiates as well. Yeah, and actually there's saying, um, uh, there's a kind of synthetic siloborin, I think uh, that synthetic uh, uh, psychedelic that is works kind of on the opiate receptors as well as the typical psychedelic serotonin receptors and can help with pain and a non-addictive form of uh, analgesics. Good stuff on the horizon. <laughs> I, um, right now, mainly what I do is psychotherapy. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Okay. Um, in private practice. And more of my practice has shifted towards trying to work with people that are either considering using psychedelics, have used psychedelics and had challenging experiences, or nice experiences, and want to process and talk about that. That's a pretty significant portion of my client right now. 
Um, another thing that I do is ketamine assisted psychotherapy, which I'm really enjoying and I'm surprised how much I was going to enjoy it. Um, working with people like Dr. D and um, sort of helping people in this process of going through really challenging experiences, um, non-ordinary states of consciousness, expanding states of consciousness, there's all these different names for it, but sitting with them, uh, developing a, a relationship with them ahead of time, and helping on the back end with the integration. Because a lot of times the experiences are so overwhelming for people, it can be very profound and hard to process, and so having somebody who's experienced like that themselves a lot of different contexts. There's actually even ethic in uh, psychedelic assisted therapy that you should administer or be with somebody with a psychedelic that you've never tried before. It's like, even if it's not the same journey, you have your own sense of what the experience is like. So that's something that I feel like I can bring to the table and something that I'm very excited to be a part of. There's a big, big movement emerging. A lot of it's on the West Coast. The East Coast and not so much in the middle of the country. Um, but it is incredibly exciting and a lot of it lately has been around MDMA, which is not a traditional psychedelic per se, um, but has very therapeutic qualities and it works very well with therapists. Therapists other than the time, which is like eight hours, so therapists that we have to be prepared to sit with the client for like eight hours. But during that time, it's some of the deepest therapy, healing, I can say healing quite confidently now. I've never been able to say that confidently until this emerging psychedelic therapy paradigm uh, re-emerges, I should say. Um, but I've seen and been a part of and personal experience very deep transformations that are very challenging. And things like MDMA, which has a very focusing quality, a very, they call it like a heart-forming quality, um, but also it like suppresses your amygdala, which is like your fear center. So you can talk about some of the hardest shit you've ever experienced in your entire life. And you really don't feel fear much at all. And ketamine can actually do that too in, in very interesting ways. It's quite different in some ways than, um, than MDMA. But both of them, and, and there are going to be more, there already is more for treatment of like, complex PTSD. Um, I feel like your best bet is going to be MDMA at this point, and that's with some kind of safe container. Like, when I say container, I mean mindset going in, setting, like, your environment's very safe, you feel very you're with somebody that you feel very comfortable with, who can be with you through some pretty challenging things. It's, um, uh, Rick Doblin, the head of MAPS, joked, he, he referenced somebody who's in uh, MDMA clinical study. He said, I don't know why they call this ecstasy. Because uh, he said better to call it like empathy or something. Because like you're still feeling all kinds of intense emotions, but it's bearable. And you feel like you're moving through them, especially when you have the support of, of a therapist. It doesn't have to be a therapist. And I, I'm a big believer in that. Um, there's lots of really impressive organizations that are coming up, and people that have been doing this for years and years and years, like long lineages, you know? A lot of them are not rooted in the U.S., uh, but even like the Native American church with peyote rituals, like you, there's lots of different safe containers for people to deeply explore um, their inner landscape. And a lot of that is healing from trauma and pain, emotional, physical, and so on, so I'm just so excited for all of this. Michael, can you kind of describe some of the training? Because I know that you've uh, been out to the West Coast pretty frequently to some of these uh, facilities. Yeah. So right now, the most above the board <laughs> is above the board training. Is, uh, California Institute for Integral Studies. Um, they have a certificate in psychedelic research and therapy. And they partner with MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And so you, the program I'm in, you get like training in lots of different psychedelic substances. Not a whole lot of experiences, unfortunately, at this point. They're working on that. Um, but you learn about like 
I had a class with like um, Bill Richards at Johns Hopkins and Ray Casamano. Uh, uh, let's see, Mike and Andy Mitchell, I like the head MDMA trainers right now for maps. I had a class with them, and so you get to kind of it's, it's definitely more on the kind of like clinical research end of things, but um, but they do a pretty good job of like bringing in like a lot of like the cultural context around a lot of these sacred plants for a lot of cultures and their lineage goes back thousands of years, kind of like the guy that, the guy's name? The bee guy. Oh, right. Right, yeah. So like, you, you go to lots of places, including the U.S., and like there's lineages that go back, way, way back, and you got to try and honor them without appropriating them, and I really appreciated that about this, um, this training program. So. Um. Doctor, um, so you've been doing ketamine for how long now? Since 2018, I think. So, so uh, in St. Louis, so you have people come to your facility, you go to the IV, and uh, what uh, therapeutic resources, including the therapists who they can follow up? Yes, but we, if we are definitely needing more and more. I think there are some people that don't feel necessarily comfortable. I mean, while I think like you were alluding to, you know, you want to have somebody that kind of understands that therapeutic guidance, uh, but that CAP training can be very helpful. Um, so we usually use the muscle with uh, Michael and a couple therapists there. Um, we, in terms of sort of maintenance for a few, you know, we now are seeing two elongate time between infusions, uh, use the kind of the home treatment, so the microdosing, nasal spray, or the oral. And, and people have used to seeing that, that you know, I haven't needed to come to my infusion as often. Um, they just are functioning better. And so then, then we use less time off for less meeting. So it's, I think that we are onto something great in terms of treatment. And then also with maintaining now where your, where your mental health is at a certain level, um, then cannabis or other natural medicine are very healing and effective. Uh, so CBD, CBG, CBN, added to THC really helps kind of make people help or, or operate naturally and function much better. So what, you're, so what you're telling me is that people who go to school for social work have an emerging field where there's demand for these kind of services if they have the appropriate way. Yes, yes, it definitely is a need. And I feel like now with better, I think they're in the psychiatry and psychology and Oh, there's such a burnout because nothing worked and people are getting worse. And now we finally have several tools that work very well. So it almost makes your job interesting or fun again. Yeah. The other thing that I'm very excited about um, in this in the training program, but also like just broadly speaking, that there's it's kind of like all hands on deck. So I'm looking at April right now, and I have like a deep a connection to nurses because my mom was a nurse and I think like there's so much that like different professionals and just people that want to help can get involved in various ways and uh, like I have a midwife in my program which who would think that I didn't think this but I had this midwife my friend Barry who's like watching this person like going through this really intense psychedelic trip and she's like oh yeah that reminds me exactly of this one birth that I did and so there's like all of these interesting parallels with all these different fields and so having like one or two people especially with really intense experiences when people are processing a lot of deep trauma it's more it's very important to have like a variety of people a variety of skill sets there's a lot of people that are like body workers that are getting involved and with the mass protocol right now, which when it gets approved, it's gonna be, there needs to be at least one licensed therapist, then there could be one non-licensed therapist. It could be a therapist in training, it could be a massage therapist, it could be a nurse, it could be a physical therapist. But the more, um, think of it like mind, body, spirit, the more you can do that, uh, the more effective it's going to be. And so like, the idea of body work is not that on my radar and now I'm like, I need to, you know, get more close, be friends with people who are body workers, or get some of my own training because the the role that that's playing has been interesting and incredible. So I'm just trying to give a sense of the breadth 
of what's going on. So, yeah, uh, Doctor, uh, I think you uh, I heard you say something about uh, uh, your toxicity. So, I've I, I, I <coughs> Well, <clears throat> I guess maybe it comes from the DMT molecule, and uh, well, so detox detoxing is so important. <coughs> Personal survey there is you know when we we're exposed to all these things, even just fake foods, fake medicines, stress, we just accumulate toxins. When we're making muscle or making new things in our body, we have waste, and we need an effective way to get rid of them. <clears throat> and most unfortunately, it's most stored in our body, so we do need a process of detoxing and uh, so they talk about like, infrared sauna use and uh, things like that you know regularly doing that exercise you know sweating every day uh, but sometimes it's hard to get that stuff out of the brain and so um with that i think maybe the dmt molecule part of it and it is found in ayahuasca and alone uh does tend to do that kind of like flood the brain and uh and then kind of release and so People feel like they're that oneness, you know, the byproduct or the end result of getting that blood is that you do have a kind of a release or a detoxification effect. Um, but what more I am aware of is kind of neuroplasticity. So it's almost like even just when you're, you can't lose weight unless you're kind of detoxing some of these uh, toxins out of your fat cells. Same thing with uh, growing brain cells. You're, you're Achieving that neuroplasticity or that chain or that growth is going to be hard if there's kind of toxins there, and even even stemming from you no know, trauma, so psychological toxins, you know those those memories and the association, so kind of breaking some of those into actually physical, you know, heavy metals or other kind of toxins, and then the fertilizer or these psychedelic medicines can help that BB and that brain derived neurotropic factor and then your brain cells will be kind of stronger and healthier. I hope I answered that question and <laughs> around in that way. But yeah, definitely think they work hand in hand in neuro detoxing the brain and then regrowing it. Uh, the saying that I like, which I guess is like probably applies to a whole lot of things, which I, I didn't even know too much about this, which is exciting, but it's like, uh, when, when the dam breaks, the river will flow. And I think that applies to a whole lot of things, whether that be psychological, emotional, physical. Uh, go ahead. When you touched upon that neuroplasticity, I was at uh, Notre Dame a few years back, and there was, I they canceled the one, I ended up in one on pornography, got off the salt, but I'm sitting there and then I decide to go into this whole explanation about you know, redirecting your sexual energy from masturbation and not from blah, blah, blah. But they were explaining about how that affected the brain, the front, front part of the brain and everything. So I'm curious uh, uh, two, two facets, really. When you're talking about the detoxing, uh, and I've looked at some certain plants and things to eat for chelation of the brain while there is allegedly something that is done medically also to eliminate toxins so that's one question are you aware of which foods are best for chelation um, of the brain to, to, to rid our bodies of toxins and then the other one is uh, it was a, such a curious thing there was a, a gentleman that lost his eye as a child so I had this natural curiosity developed as he became a gifted um, musician, okay? So I often wondered if the use of one eye leading to one side of the brain didn't cause him to be so gifted in that region of the brain as a result of only being able to use the eye that connected more to that region. Anything on either of those? Interesting, very interesting. Um, and first about detoxing with, uh, with foods. You know, I think one thing is so hard is to get the blood brain barrier, pass the blood brain barrier. And so, really, historically, with, when you're eating foods, you're mainly going to be detoxing the body. Um, but, uh, you know, so then we, if you want to enter the 
brain really the best way to do that is IV. So there are some IV protocols um, like DSMO um, and uh, you know other chelators that you can use and you give it IV for a series and you know people whatever you know heavy metals mainly but uh, they will DSMO D yeah DSMO DMSO yeah um, and gosh I don't know what that for but <laughs> and other chelators EDTA is another and give an IV. Um, when you when they worked with uh, uh, there was a Dr. Yu, he worked with um, firefighters in not after 9-11, they got that smoke inhalation. So he used, you know, activated charcoal um, and uh, infrared sauna. And, and so basically, you know, kind of detox, you know, brain and how the sauna works is really interesting. It and they can work in the you know brain really because it kind of penetrates about two inches and uh and kind of stirs up the movement there and kind of pushes toxins out and so that is kind of getting deep a deep detox and then using that charcoal whatever you do get kind of released from the brain from the gut you will you know drink the charcoal after a sauna session and then kind of sequester it and then you just That's waste it that you would bring up So, uh, real quick, uh, where are we on time? 3.35. Okay, we need to do a hard stop at uh, 2.55 so we can get Dr. Agarwal on the Zoom, but uh, uh, Michael, I saw you have a... And I have a really... Where's your clinic located? I have a friend with uh, treatment-resistant depression who I think this would be a great fit for your approach. Great, thank you. It is in Brentwood, across from Whole Foods, kind of down from the Galleria, 1760 South Brentwood Boulevard. Um, it's in St. Louis, yeah. Okay. And uh, where is your friend? He's here in Columbia. Okay. But I think he would definitely travel for treatment. Here. Yeah, I think that is probably the best to do. You know, to get if it's treatment resistant depression, I think the IV is the kind of the gold standard. Um, but the home use is kind of makes it accessible later. And I, I also kind of was, there's so much talk about the vaccine and, and then the stats of the vaccine and really kind of mentioning about the COVID vaccine and all the, uh, I think it was like 76% and it doesn't reduce transmission, but it may prevent hospitalization. And uh, ketamine really should be considered a vaccine for suicide. It, it was studied and even one dose, one infusion made those thoughts vanish for up to 80% of people well, for up to three months. And so that is pretty good odds, more than any COVID vaccine. So, you know, really, if, the, right, it's just we need to market it or kind of have that. The other thing is there's no big pharma. And on one hand, that may be good, uh, but on the other hand, there's no voice. And so nobody talks about it. Nobody knows about the results except maybe doctors who experience it. And, uh, and so it really needs to get out there that this is a viable treatment and can help. So many people. Yes. I want to thank you for being somebody who has a gun to do a million things because I'm well aware of what the, the foundation is. Very, very big problem, very, very big medical model, single model for every single medical I know for a fact that I'm all who's getting trauma. And it's just been so horrendous.
you're aware with uh, MDMA, which should be 2023 more widely available, even off label for things beyond uh, treatment. I think I don't remember. It's like complex PTSD, what they can focus all of their attention on. But some of the data around that is fuck. It's wild. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's fucking fascinating. Uh, 67% of people with over 10 years, it's like an average, like a median of 10 years, uh, diagnosed with PTSD. And this is like wartime PTSD, but when you listen to the stories, it's like it goes way back to childhood. 67% um, a year later, after three MDMA sessions and 12, I think it's like 12 psychotherapy sessions, 67% no longer qualified for PTSD. And I think it was like in the mid low 80s for um, clinically significant reductions. So that's just with three MDMA treatments with a rigid MDMA protocol through the FDA. So just kind of like hang tight too, like, because, and I, I'm saying this in conjunction with ketamine and psilocybin and all these other new things that are coming down the pike, like, I could see a really beautiful synergy of a lot of these, these substances in conjunction with supportive people uh, in a whole variety of ways, and there being some pretty significant healing uh, for people. And it, I, I, I still don't, it doesn't, it kind of blows my mind to hear like a year later, like, and these are people that are like, they come out and they're like, they still have this, like, sort of these very intense downloads, if you want to call that, or sort of realizations that come up within them, where they, they're like, I trust my inner healer, I can do these things, and it leads to like, you know, ending of relationships sometimes, it ends, you know, like, changes in diet, and like, moving, whatever it is that they need to sort of get themselves out of a tough situation, because they've been sort of operating from a place of their trauma. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really cool, and I just, I'm so excited. I agree with you 100%, and I think, like, it's, I hope it's bigger than just healthcare, which is, like, a point that I wanted to make today. It's, like, right, and, and I want it to, like, I want these models to exist, and that's why I like the decriminalization aspect of it, too, is, like, um, I was in San Francisco and Oakland, and there was this uh, psychedelic community called the Sacred Garden Community. They're, like, non-religious, but uh, sort of a spiritual community, but, like, you know, they're operating within in this legal framework and they're 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 doing this incredibly responsibly and there's like lots of really safe ways to do it and it doesn't have to be in a medical framework. I think like it's worth pursuing as I'm here, but I do not think that's the only way that this should be happening. Because you have like the Native American church for example that's been doing this for decades upon decades and they have a really clean model. I'm not saying Take their model, but like there's ways to do this that don't require it wouldn't require me or a doctor, and I'm okay with that. You know, as long as people are doing this responsibly and putting intention behind it, and um, you know, not taking advantage of people, like there are ways to do that. So, and to speak to your um, altered states, I've, uh, there's this guy Stan Groff, who's like really um, a big LSD researcher back in the day. Yeah, uh, like he didn't like to say altered states. He would say uh, not ordinary states or expanded states. Or, or, uh, this other one. Oh, and then like what we do every day is sort of everyday waking consciousness. So it's like sort of saying like we exist in this band of consciousness, and then there's all these levels above, below, left, right, whatever you want to say that we're not typically accessing. And so it's this expanded. Consciousness model 
and sort of saying that usually to survive, we stay within this very narrow range. So the, the idea that altered is sort of suggesting that it's like not right. And so saying non-ordinary or expanded sort of changes the paradigm a little bit. Yeah. Kind of along those lines, what are, the, as the medical side of the equation, what are the things that you two are noticing would be most helpful to your side of the ecosystem that would take, take the movement to the next level um, in, in terms of uh, using psychedelics for healing? I got a short answer. My short answer is just like this sort of being rolled out from lots of different, in lots of different ways, like there being sort of like religious exemptions, there being sort of like a personal liberty exemption, there being sort of like medical justification for it, that there's all of these different ways in which people can get involved in their own way. And I do not, I'm not fond of, although I'm, I'm, I'm open to, it's not my favorite way, it's not my preference to like say like, oh, like just like do it sort of like in an irresponsible or unintentional way. I'm, I'm open to it, but I'd like if I, if, if, just to give people the option of having like a safe container and like testing substances, like all of these things that are super, super important to me. And and right now there's just not a whole lot of that because it's criminalized and in a lot of ways still. And, and that creates a whole uh, framework uh, where you are violent uh, you have to be violent, or you just have to be sneaky about it. You have to do all these things to try and do things that could potentially be really um, healing for you. So I don't have like a specific answer. Great. <laughs> you don't have to be sick or suffering to benefit from it. Yeah, April said that you don't have to be sick or suffering to benefit. I mean, believe that in a sense. I don't have much to add to that, except that you know the accessibility. And, and legal issues, uh, but also kind of maybe the awareness. Uh, you know, even with cannabis, I was med the medical profession needs you know whole educational overhaul. Your all, all doctors taught marijuana is a drug of abuse. You know, suicide, all the Schedule One. That's how it's classified. There's no medical value, and so going up again. You know, it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. So to go up against that, you know, with Medical professionals, you know, you lose a lot of credibility or you get a lot of strange looks. So it definitely is the education and legality that is a concern. Just a little comment on that. Uh, one line I've heard is like, people aren't stupid, they've just been stupefied. <laughs> yeah, the back. Yeah, um, I think something I've been wondering is just kind of like, Mainstreaming and sort of legitimizing of psychedelics and then going in, in large part through kind of that like medical funnel. Um, yeah. yeah, because any sort of um, either professional or legal or possibly even like uh, economic forces that would sort of cause it to kind of stop at that gate. I think there's fear of that. I'm not too up on like different state policies and uh, federal policies. There's, I know, like in my program, for example, there's a lot of people that are very frustrated with like Compass Pathways, for example, which is a big uh, psilocybin company because they're kind of uh, patenting things in ways that make it very challenging for people to access them in other ways. And so that's very important. It's a concern that I have that like that it will be sort of like bankrolled and um, only be accessible to like rich people who uh, can like afford this. And it's something that I struggle with personally and professionally because I do want to get paid for what I do. But um, so any kind of like community models that can be um, 
integrated. I'm a big proponent of, and I I know there's been some. I mean, you know, not too many people know that there's like some controversy around like decrypt nature movements, uh, but I love the concept and I love the movement. It's a very uh, kind of community based model and uh, kind of like grow your own and uh, do it in these safe ways. And I love that they're doing that. And I, I just to like, uh, to like shout out to my home state, Michigan, Ann Arbor, and Detroit has decriminalized. I'm very excited that they have this statewide policy um, to decriminalize, but they're also putting in there um, ways for guides, um, sitters, facilitators, therapists to get paid. Not for the, the drug or the substance exchange, but for the, the service of sitting with somebody. And I thought that was such a cool thing. And I hadn't seen it in other places. And I think it's from like some of the decrypt people, but I just thought that was like a really cool model. Um, so I'm not if I have much to add to that, but I think the accessibility and affordability is hard, you know, at least with. Um, other medications, even Spravato, which is the uh, big pharma version of uh, the nasal spray as, as ketamine, uh, they have insurance subsidies. So, you know, you have insurance, you can get Spravato covered and use it, but yet ketamine, I, you know, the generic, which is more effective, especially when given IV, there's, there's no funding for, and so that it's off-label, uh, yet the studies are there that it works so well. So even funding accessibility is always an issue. Yes? I don't know how I understand correctly or not, but I heard you say doctors can prescribe the DNA for the patients. Not yet. Okay. So in a couple of years, the idea to okay. Not quite, but they're, um, I can't remember what the phase is, but they're pretty far along the FDA phase three. Thank you. Uh, it's, they're, they're having some very particular roadblocks that a lot of other uh, drugs do not have to go through because of the stigma around MDMA, and they have to do a lot more safety data. Uh, but basically, the short answer is not yet, unless you get enrolled in a clinical trial, which is very hard to do at this point because they're just not recruiting that many people. Um, there's a lot of therapists, not enough, that are being trained because the way it's going to be rolled out uh, in the next couple of years is there's going to be a prescriber, there's going to be a clinic, there's going to be MDMA administered on site, there has to be a licensed therapist, um, some other um, helping professional, some kind of license or pre license, um, but it's coming. And it's not the cool thing is. They're talking about it right now with PTSD, but there's going to be a lot of other, they're doing stuff with couples therapy right now, uh, MDMA, which is just so cool. Um, and it seems like the therapist doesn't really have to do too much in the session. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just kind of like both, both parties are, both the partners are, are tripping and then they're just working through their stuff. Um, so it's like it's coming and there's going to be lots of, new applications. They're just focusing on, uh, right now it's like combat vets or first responders, PTSD, um, and they're finding really good clinical data. And I think it's going to be better for some people in some populations because PTSD and war vets is like, that's a really complex and challenging thing to deal with. And um, and they're, they're doing some amazing stuff. So it's like, it's going to be Cool to see it all roll out, and 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 that they will have to follow once once it's um, what's the word FDA approved in this very specific way. Um, they can start not following the protocol. So you could be like, I want to do we could do an MDMA session and then maybe a ketamine session, or those ketamine sessions are. Um, so like they'll they'll start to open up, and then the protocols will be a little less rigid, and then you might be able to sort of tailor make your treatment protocol based on what seems to make sense. And there are already, I know a few in my program that are underground therapists, also above ground kind of a thing. And they're doing things like um, taking MDMA, but then like low dose psilocybin an hour in, and then maybe finishing with some heavy, but in 
low dose of ketamine. Like, like just, but they're 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 dialing it in, you know, like, and they kind of know their stuff. But um, so we're not trying to give any kind of recommendations, but they're. There's a lot of kind of like experimentation and sort of like bulk knowledge that's being passed around in places like Southern California or like uh, like San Francisco is a big one. So um, just really interesting stuff, and it's going to be interesting to see how it all sort of merges together over the next couple of years. Does that answer your question? I'm gonna I'm gonna add. Um, so our next speaker, Dr. Sunil Agarwal, who's an old friend of mine. Um, is currently suing the DEA because the federal right to try statute should allow him to prescribe a Schedule One drug like MDMA to a patient. And the DEA says that the, right, the federal right to try statute does not create an exception to the Controlled Substances Act. So this, uh, uh, that, so he shouldn't be able to do it. And uh, uh, that lawsuit right now is in the courts. Uh, but I'm going to use that to wrap this up because I want to get Dr. Agarwal on the Zoom so he can talk to us. Um, but I want to thank Dr. Thomas again for joining us. We're not just being here, but also substantially enabling our four users on this issue. I'd also like to thank Michael because Michael. <laughs> Give yourselves a few minutes, make a little talk, stretch your legs, and we'll get Dr. Agarwal to the zoo.